tuning in, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. So far, we've been focusing primarily on Christianity within the Roman Empire in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. That is, the land surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. Nevertheless, Christianity also spread south to Africa, north to Armenia, and east to Asia, where it reached Persia, India, and even China. Hopefully, this session will counterbalance the Mediterranean focus we've had so far, expanding your perspective to be a little bit more global. Here now is episode 502, Early Church History, number 20, Early African, Armenian, and Asian Christianity. Philip Jenkins wrote in his book, The Lost History of Christianity, by the fifth century, Christianity had five great patriarchates and only one, Rome, was to be found in Europe. Of the others, Alexandria stood on the African continent and three, Constantinople, Antioch, and Jerusalem were in Asia. Constantinople is so close to not being in Asia, <laughs> it's not even funny, but I guess technically it's still counts as the Asian continent there. But that's something to think about, isn't it? That so much of Christianity as we think of it today is European Christianity. So much of what I've focused on in this class so far has been European Christianity. But the true reason for that, at least I, I can't speak for all other church historians, but for myself, the true reason for that is because of the amount of surviving material, literary, archaeological, inscriptions, and coins. That's what we have. It's the stuff from Europe and the stuff from Alexandria and, and North Africa. Uh, what we have from other parts of the world is very little in comparison to what we have from Europe. So when we tell about church history, tell the story of the church, we tend to be very Europe heavy. But I, I want to tell you what I know about these other places because they're important too, and Christianity was spreading there right from the beginning too. So I want to begin with Africa. Of course, Jesus had a relationship with Africa. Africa protected Jesus when he was a baby from his own government. And he was a refugee in Egypt. And um, also, when he came to carry his cross, he was not able. And it was an African who carried his cross for him as well. A man from Cyrene called Simon. Uh, and it's interesting in Mark 15, 21, when it talks about Simon of Cyrene, it says his sons, Alexander and Rufus, uh, it mentions them. And it's like, well, why would you mention them unless the people that are reading this book knew Alexander and Rufus, that their sons were part of the church, the very early church? So I, I believe the Africans were part of Christianity from the very beginning, from generation zero, not even generation one, from generation zero. Africans bookended the life of Christ as a baby and at his death. At the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, there were people there from Egypt and Libya, Jewish people that were visiting for the festival and presumably brought their Christianity back with them. At Antioch, there was a church mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 1, that talks about Simeon called Niger, which is the Latin word for black, and Lucius of Cyrene. These are members of the church that Paul and Barnabas were also a part of in Antioch, where we had Jews and non-Jews sharing table fellowship. So that's all from the first century. As far as Egypt goes, I'm just going to very briefly mention Egypt and North Africa, also called the Maghreb, before we go to Ethiopia. Ethiopia is where I want to go. I will say this about, about Egypt. Absolutely incredible influence on early Christian history. Uh, not always for the best, in my opinion, but that's my opinion. That they were influential is undisputed. Okay? We've seen a ton of what, especially the city of Alexandria, produced as far as theologians and bishops, 
We looked at Clement of Alexandria, Origen of Alexandria, and his bishop Demetrius of Alexandria, and Arius of Alexandria, and Athanasius of Alexandria, and there are many other Alexandrian influential Christians in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, and 5th centuries. I did want to also mention that the native people of Egypt do not speak Greek. They speak a language called Coptic. And Coptic is an Egyptian language written in Greek letters. And so from the second century, the Christian scriptures, the New Testament, are translated into Coptic. So it's one of our most ancient translations. And uh, manuscript critics, people that compare the manuscripts to each other, textual critics, they use the Coptic translations to help make decisions. The Egyptian church broke away from the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church in the year 451. Uh, I'll speak more about that next time. I'll talk all about the 5th century next time. On to the Maghreb, uh, which is another way to say ancient Mauritania or North Africa. So we can see over here we have Egypt on the east, and then you have Cyrene right here, and then this part on the west is Mauritania. We today call all this northern strip the Maghreb. It's a part of Africa that's habitable north of the Sahara Desert and, and touching the Mediterranean. Today, these are the countries of Algeria, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco, Tunisia, and the Western Sahara in general. In their time, these were places occupied by the Berber nations. This B-E-R-B-E-R, -E -E the Berber nations. These were people that lived in this region, some still live in this region to this day. And there, there's a lot to be said about these people. We've already covered them a lot, so I don't want to get into it too much, but there were some very famous martyrs in uh, Scylla in Numidia, in Carthage, Perpetua and Felicitas in the third century. Tertullian was there in Carthage in the third century. Cyprian was in Carthage in the third century. Novation, Donatus, Augustine of Hippo himself lived in North Africa, in Hippo Regius, right by Carthage. So we're just going to kind of move along to our next place in Africa and look at the Ethiopian church. As you know, the Ethiopian treasurer became a Christian. He was the treasurer to the Kandake, uh, often translated Candace as if it's a name, but Kandake was a title of someone who served the queen of the Ethiopians. Presumably, he brought Christianity with him in the first century to Ethiopia. We don't know anything about what might have happened there. Maybe he made some converts. Maybe he didn't. We don't know. But that's not where Ethiopian Christianity really comes from. Although there may have been some Ethiopian Christians as a result of it. Okay? I don't know if that made any sense. Let me explain. King Azena of the Aksumite Empire is really the guy we need to, to look at. So let me tell you the story. The story is there was a philosopher named Meropius from Tyre. Tyre is on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. And he went on an expedition to India. And in order to go to India in those days, what you do is you go to the Red Sea from Egypt, you get on a boat, and then you, you make your way down the Red Sea, and then you go east to India. What happened with this journey is that he had with him a whole bunch of people on the boat, including two young boys that he was responsible for, presumably teaching. And on the way home, they stopped for provisions, and the natives killed everyone, except for the two boys. The two boys they brought as slaves to the king of Aksum, which is uh, roughly modern-day Ethiopia. The uh, king who received them, he had nothing to do with killing anyone or enslaving them. He just received them as a gift, I guess. He was impressed with them. He thought they were smart. And he put them in positions of responsibility. He made one in charge of the treasury and another one a secretary of some sort. When the king died, he released them. He set them free so they could go and do whatever they wanted. The queen, however... She had a son who was too young to take over, so she was going to be ruling for a while. And she begged them, one of them is named Frumentius, and the other is Odysseus. 
she begged them to stay until the boy was grown, and then he could become the king, and then they could leave. So they, they, and they agreed. They stayed on, and they helped her to run things. At this point, Fermentius feels like uh, he has the ability to really exert himself, you know, because he's no longer a slave. He's in a position of great responsibility, and he's got a secure position. Rufinus tells the story about this. He says, God stirred up Frumentius' mind and spirit so that he began unceasingly to inquire whether there were Christians among the Roman merchants. He gave them the greatest power and urged them to establish meeting places in various sites where they might come together for the sake of prayer in the Roman rite. So we're in Axum, which is the kingdom in Africa, south of Egypt, directly south of Egypt, and Yet, there are Roman merchants. There are merchants because there's a trade route that goes from Egypt, to, uh, really Alexandria, but like you have to go over land for a little while, and then you get to the Red Sea. And then from there, one of the ports is part of this Aksumite kingdom. But then also, you will get to what we call today Yemen, the southern part of Saudi Arabia. And there's trade there. And then all the way to India. Okay, so this is all part of a trade route. And so you have mariners, you have merchants, you have money being made. And some of them are Christians. And Fermentius is like, well, can I support the Christians that are already here in the kingdom? And he encourages them and he helps them to build churches. So this is where Christianity starts. They're not really Aksumite Christians or Ethiopian Christians, but they're foreigners. But at least now they're starting to be churches in the, in the realm. Well, the boy grew up in Frumentius, and Odysseus handed everything over. Odysseus said, I'm going home. He went back to Tyre. Rufinus says, that's how we heard about this whole thing, and that's how we wrote it down. It's from the testimony of Odysseus. Frumentius, instead of going home, he goes to Alexandria, which is not that far to get to, maybe like three or four weeks' journey at most. He gets there, and he goes to the bishop, who at this time is Athanasius, of Alexandria, and he says to Athanasius, there are Christians in Axum. You have to send a bishop down to coordinate them, to organize them, to spiritually take care of them, to pastor them. Athanasius says, you are the man. And he ordains Frumentius and sends Frumentius down back where he came from, but now as bishop. So Fermentius then spreads Christianity in the kingdom, and at a certain point, we're not exactly sure when, he even converts the new king, King Azana. That's the boy that has now grown into a man. Now, Athanasius, as you recall, was a very controversial person. He was obsessed with homoousion. And so he wanted, I, I have no doubt, that he made sure that Frumentius was going to learn and then teach the Trinity doctrine of one and the same substance, which we know about because the emperor after Constantine, one of the emperors after Constantine, one of, one of his heirs, was called Constantius. And Constantius was not a uh, homoousion. He believed in subordinationism. He agreed with Arius. And he wrote a letter to the king of Axum, about Frumentius, okay? And uh, we have a little bit of a text of that letter, and we can read, it says, Wherefore, considering, and this is preserved by Athanasius, by the way, uh, so this is the words of the Roman emperor Constantius, Wherefore, considering that you are deserving of the same provident care as the Romans, you, the king of the Ethiopians, and desiring to show equal regard for your welfare, we command that the same doctrine be professed in your churches as in theirs. Send, therefore, speedily into Egypt the bishop Frumentius to the most venerable bishop George and the rest who are there who have a special authority to appoint to these offices and to decide questions concerning them. For of course you know and remember, unless you alone pretend to be ignorant of that which all men are well aware of, that this Frumentius was advanced to this present rank by Athanasius, a man who is guilty of 10,000 crimes. For he has not been able fairly to clear himself of any of the charges brought against him, but was at once deprived of a sea, and now wanders about destitute of any fixed abode, and passes from one country to another, 
as if by this means he could escape his own wickedness. Now if Fermentius shall readily obey our commands and shall submit to an inquiry into all the circumstances of his appointment, he will show plainly to all men that he is in no respect opposed to the laws of the church and the established faith. So Constantius wants Fermentius, he wants the king, Zena, to send Fermentius to Alexandria because he's already kicked Athanasius out and he's put in a new guy, a guy named George, and George is going to teach He's going to make sure Fermentius agrees that the father is greater than the son, that they're not equal, but the father is greater. So far as we know, King Azana never did anything with this letter. Uh, He never sent Fermentius. But this letter is more evidence that there was such a person named Fermentius, that there were Christians in the Axum region at that time. We also have other evidence of Ethiopian Christianity from King Azana's reign. We have coinage between the years 330 and 350, with a Greek cross on the coin. Whereas before, there was uh, typical pagan symbols like a crescent moon and things like that, but now it's Christian crosses. And we also have several inscriptions from Azena that survive that we have translations into English. Most of these are written in the Ethiopian language called Ge'ez, G-E apostrophe E-Z. I'm probably saying it wrong, apologies. But one of the inscriptions is also written in Greek. And this is from the Greek one here. It says, With faith in God, this is the king's inscription, carved in stone. With faith in God and by the power of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who saved the kingdom for me, with the faith in his Son, Jesus Christ, who has helped me and will always help me, I, Azanus, king of the Aksumites and Himyarites, and Raiden, and of the Sabaeans, and of the Silel, and of Kaso, and of Beja, and of Tiamo, Bisa Alin, son of Elah Amida, servant of Christ, thank the Lord my God. Whew. I want to thank the Lord my God. That inscription is over. So you can see explicitly Christian language here being used. He's comfortable saying Jesus Christ, and he calls himself the servant of Christ. It's a very strong statement for a king of any sort to say. And so the pre-conversion Inscriptions of the same king talk about Astar, Beher, and Meder, which are gods of the sky, the sea, and the earth, respectively. And then there's an, a third inscription, which is vague. It just talks about the Lord, the Lord of all, or the Lord of heaven. Okay? And that was written in the Ethiopian language. This one's written in Greek. The Ethiopians can't read Greek. So this one's like super Christianized, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if this is a propaganda move or what, but this is the evidence that we have of this Aksumite kingdom. So this is one of the very first kingdoms to have Christianity. Late in the 5th century, a group of Christians came down to Aksum called the Nine Saints, and uh, they were probably fleeing persecution related to the issues that happened in 451 with the Council of Chalcedon. They came down from Syria, at least one, and they started building monasteries And uh, so these nine saints helped to spread Christianity in the kingdom of Aksum. And they find inaccessible locations to build their monasteries, such as this location in Debri Damo, Ethiopia today. It's a very inaccessible place, essentially a plateau that is very difficult to get to the top of. And on top of it, they would build their monastery patterned after Pacomius, If you remember, Pacomius was the man who kind of franchised the monastery idea in the Egyptian desert right after the time of Anthony the Great. And Pacomian monasteries typically will have a round church in the center and then little huts separated from each other where the monks will live individually. Whereas later European monasteries, they live in one building and they have one room and everyone sleeps in the one room. This is a monastery built on top of a plateau, only accessible by rope. There are no stairs. There is no ladder. There is no elevator. To this day, if you want to go to this monastery, you have to climb a rope to get to the top. (laughs) Now, let me tell you the bad news. The bad news is that in February 2021, the Eritrean Defense Forces looted and bombed 
this monastery, which has stood from the time of the nine saints going to the Aksumite kingdom way back centuries and centuries ago. So I don't know what shape it's in. I think what I read was they destroyed 12 buildings in their, their bombing of the site. And uh, so that, since that was a couple years ago, who knows if they've rebuilt it or what the situation is. All right, one more thing about the Ethiopians is that in the 6th century, there was a king named Caleb, and the Roman emperor named Justin I asked King Caleb to cross the Red Sea and go over to what we would think of today as the southern tip of Saudi Arabia and to attack over there because the Christians on the um, Arabian Peninsula have been persecuted by the king of Himyar, a person named Du Nawas. And so Caleb goes and he defeats this other kingdom and he rebuilds the churches there. So Christianity is very strong in this, in this kingdom. There's also a great African kingdom called Mercuria that really only begins to come into existence as far as Christianity goes in the second half of the 6th century, a little beyond our period for this class, so I'm not going to get into it. But if you want to know about a powerful other kingdom in the same general region that was able to be strong enough to, to hold the Muslims who come in the 7th century, to hold them from going south, uh, you can look up Mercuria. All right, we have to talk about Armenia next. Armenia is a piece of land between the Romans and the Persians. What a difficult spot to live between two major world powers that are constantly fighting with each other in your land, constantly conquering and then reconquering uh, territory in your land, just south and east of the Black Sea. There were two streams of missionaries that came into Armenia, one from the south, from the city called Edessa, and the other from the west, from Constantinople. So from the south and from the west, Christianity spreads to Armenia. By the time of Gregory, I'm going to talk to you about Gregory in just a minute, Christianity was already in Armenia in pockets. But Armenia, just like the Persian Empire or the Parthian Empire or the Sassanid Empire, all equivalent regions of space that are used in different terms for different reasons, there's a Zoroastrian religion there. So Armenia is mostly Zoroastrian, and then Christianity starts to come in with um, you know, just normal spread of things, but then in a big way with a man named Gregory the Illuminator, or Grigor Lusovorich. Translate to English, Gregory the Illuminator brought the light of Christianity to Armenia. He was a child of a noble Armenian family. His parents were murdered for political reasons, and Gregory grew up in Caesarea in Cappadocia. And after that, which is just south of Armenia, after that, he converted to Christianity and he returned to Armenia as a vigorous preacher. And he's preaching Christianity and he runs afoul of the king, a man named Tiridates III, who reigned from 298 to 330. And he ordered Gregory to be imprisoned. As the legend has it, which who knows how accurate the legend is, Gregory was dropped into a pit. And uh, an, uh, he was in there for 12 years. And they figured he was dead. But as it turns out, some old lady was throwing him a, a loaf of bread down the pit. And uh, maybe, some, I don't know, she must have given him water too. But I, I don't know how, how trustworthy this story is. But eventually, the king loses his mind because the, uh, the Roman emperor invades, the man named Diocletian invades Armenia, and Tiridates is just going nuts. We read about this in Agathangelos. It's two words. It's the word good and, a good and angel, or message, right? Agathos is the word for good, and angelos is the word for messenger, right? Angel. So it's a good message. Uh, probably not really somebody's name. Agathangelos. His history, we read, he arranged to go hunting. This is the king. And when the hounds and nets and traps and beaters were all ready, he climbed into his chariot to leave the city for the plain where he loved to hunt. Suddenly, Dear Tot, or Tiridates, fell from the chariot as if struck down by a demon. He began to rave and grunt like an animal. 
But one person had a solution. The king's sister, Kos Revitukt, had a heavenly vision which told her that only the prisoner in the pit, Gregory, could end the terrible nightmare. The prince convinced some people that there to lower long ropes into the pit, and he called out, Gregory, if you are down there, let us know. They felt a tug on the rope and pulled it up out of the pit. There was Gregory, his body blackened by dirt to the color of coal. The people helped him get clean and brought clean clothing for him, and he was taken to Vajarshapat with joy and high hopes that he could remedy the situation there. Wow. So that's what happens. Gregory prays, and the demons leave the king alone. But every time the king left the presence of Gregory, he went insane again. We read on in this account. This is a later account from a couple of centuries later. King Dirtat and the nobles would not leave Gregory's side because they were still fearful and tormented. Day and night they fasted and sat on ashes, dressed in hair shirts. Gregory used the time, for they were like this for 65 days, to tell them the whole long history of God's salvation for mankind. Many other people also came to hear Gregory's tales of the saints and his explanations of the Word of God. They were a huge crowd, attentive and filled with wonder at what they were hearing. So Gregory prays with the people, and the king is finally healed. And Gregory asks the king for permission to preach Christianity in Armenia. And Gregory travels to all these different cities and marks sites for all these churches. And in 301, King Tiridates III declared Armenia a Christian nation, making it the first Christian nation in human history. Not the Roman Empire. Ethiopia was very early too. Probably the 330s, something like that. This is 301, and this is before Constantine even converted. He uh, starts, he has his like vision or whatever in 312, 313, really starts to get involved with Christianity in 324, 325, but he's not even baptized until he's about to die. And Constantine does not really make the Roman Empire, a Christian nation. He just favors Christianity as a minority. It's really Theodosius I, I would argue, in the 380s that makes the Roman Empire a Christian nation, whereas Armenia had already been Christian for many, many years before that. Now, this is somewhat misleading, because just because you have a king that's a Christian and declares the nation a Christian doesn't mean that the people are Christian. They're still Zoroastrians. The king and Gregory worked really hard to convert the people, sometimes not using the most like persuasive techniques, instead using coercive techniques, which I think is not in the spirit of Christ. Anyhow, the kingdom of Armenia is considered the first Christian nation, if you judge by the ruler. However, there is also another contender. This little kingdom just south and west called Osron, which has the very important city of Edessa in it, that actually did have a Christian king before the Armenians. (laughs) Okay? but uh, And that was King Abgar VIII may have converted in the 3rd century. If true, the Christian kingdom of Asroin from about the years 200 to 213 was the first Christian nation until it got reabsorbed into the Roman Empire with uh, the Roman Emperor Caracalla. There you have it. Armenia was divided in half in 387s between the Romans and the Persians. And at that point, Christianity became Armenia's identity. Because politically, it was always being split and always being mixed, especially also as far as language and their religion. They started to have an identity as a people, even though the political situation was always crazy. Uh, A man named Mashtots, who single-handedly invented both mashed potatoes and tater tots. Um, Just kidding. Mashed tots, uh, who died in the year 440, was trained in in reading Greek, and he's the one that developed the Armenian alphabet. He invented, not by himself, but with the leader, what they call a bishop is a Catholicos, uh, the Armenian people do. So with with the help of the Catholicos and some others, mashed tots invents... Armenian letters, beautiful letters, complicated looking letters, and invents a written language and starts to get the Bible into Armenian. And then they want to teach the children 
the Armenian language. And we know all about this from the writings of someone named Corwin, who wrote The Life of Mashtots. And I would love to read it to you, but we don't have time anymore. So, you can look that up. Mashtot started with the book of Proverbs, and he translated the Bible. When he arrived home, it was well-received, and the king and the people decided they wanted to start teaching children. You should always start with the children if you want to change the future. So they taught the children the language, the written language of Armenian, and then they translated like crazy. Mashtots and another man named Esnik uh, tra- they, they collected as many works as they could from Constantinople and from Edessa, and they brought them home and they translated them to Armenian so people could read them in their own language. All right, let's talk about Asia. Asia is a huge place, okay? It's a huge place. We're going to look at three, India, Persia, and China. And uh, there's not really much to say about China in our period of the first 500 years of Christianity, so it's going to be very brief. I'm going to focus instead a little bit more heavily on India because I think it's often neglected. And uh, India is a very important place for Christianity because it gets Christianity so early. And it's really not talked about very much. If you ask any Indian, tell me the story of Christianity in India, their first words are always going to be the Apostle Thomas. Because all Indians know that Thomas brought Christianity to India. But if you ask an Indian, well, what evidence do you have for that? They might not immediately be able to provide you with very much. Well, let me provide you with some evidence, and you can make up your own mind. The earliest evidence that Thomas, the apostle of Jesus, doubting Thomas, that guy, went to India, is that we have a book called The Acts of Thomas from about the year 240, which was written in Edessa, and it was written in Syriac, and it survives also in Greek. And it's a legendary account of Thomas going to India. Uh, and in this book, the Acts of Thomas, which I think is probably embellished and legendary, is the technical term for it is hagiography, which is like a, a story about a saint. But they tend to have a lot of like exaggeration and, and like miracle stories that are a little hard to believe in there. In that book, the Acts, Acts of Thomas, they mention an Indian king by the name of Gundafar. And for this reason, the Acts of Thomas was completely disregarded as unhistorical. Until 1834, when they found coins in the valley of Afghanistan with Gundafar's name on them. And then they found more coins in Bactria and Punjab. So by the end of the 1800s, they even found a tablet at Peshawar, mentioning King Gundafar. So by by the 20th century, we're like, oh no, there really was an Indian king, Gundafar, and so that's not like a made-up thing from this story, just making up an Indian-sounding name. That was an actual historical person. Second point, other than the Acts of Thomas, second point is Strabo, the, um, the historian, mentioned 120 ships a year sailing from Egypt to India during the first century when he visited. So this was a thing people could do, in other words. You could go from Egypt to India, and I'll tell you exactly why. It's because about the year 40, just a few years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which was in the 30s, so about the year 40, they discovered that there were monsoon winds that went in one direction at one time of the year, and then the opposite direction another time of the year, And so no longer did ships have to crawl along the coast to get to India. They could now go straight across, which saved a huge amount of time and made it very practical and allowed them to use big ships instead of little ships that could go across the ocean and carry a lot of weight. Samuel Moffat talks about this. He said, and by the way, if you want to know about Christianity in Asia, this is the book to get, hands down called The History of Christianity in Asia by Samuel Hugh Moffat. Uh, He says, From May to September, therefore, ships needed no longer to hug the shore, but could sail before the wind across the ocean all the way to India. The whole trip, including the three weeks from Alexandria to the Red Sea, could now be accomplished in about 94 days, and larger ocean-going ships could replace the little coastal craft used hitherto. 
Some had as many as seven sails, an average between 200 and 300 tons. This is in the first century. The Mayflower of the pilgrims in 1620 was only 180 tons. We think we're so sophisticated later on, right? Like, oh, yeah. No, they, they were traveling around in two and 300 ton ships with seven sails on them already in the first century. When it comes to evidence for Thomas, we also have a couple of other statements, one by a man named Ephraim the Syrian and also Jerome. They mentioned Thomas in India. But then we also have a couple of other written sources, Origen and Eusebius, who say that Thomas was in Parthia. They don't mention India. So this causes some doubt. But then when you ask the question, what about local tradition? What about people in India? What do they say? It's overwhelming. Like everybody knows this is the place where Thomas went. That's what they claim. Samuel Moffat once again describes the conundrum as follows. He says, The general consensus of local Indian traditions is that Thomas came first to South India, not to the Punjab of King Gundafar. He landed on the Malabar coast near the ancient port of Moziris, which is mentioned in the Peripolis as the major southwestern port of the peninsula. The date was 50 or 52. He founded seven churches. In these towns, he is said to have set up seven crosses, the crosses of St. Thomas. He built a palace for the king. Thousands were converted. A group of Brahmins ordered Thomas to worship the goddess Kali in her sacred grove. The apostle refused. Angered, they speared him to death. Marco Polo visited the site of Thomas's burial in the 13th century. Gregory of Tours in the 6th century wrote of a great monastery in India where a lamp burned day and night by the body of St. Thomas, though no one fed it oil. There is a difference, of course, between tradition and history. Can we say with any certainty that Thomas was in truth the planter of the church in India? Few have dared to answer that question with an unequivocal yes or no. Given the difficulty of proving a negative answer and an equal hesitation to accept unwritten traditions without some reservation, most opinions range from possible to probable, with a discernible trend toward the latter position since the discovery of the Gundafar evidence. So we're moving from possible to probable here, and the renewal of interest in oral tradition as a source of history. So did Thomas start Christianity in India? I don't know. But I, I, there, I think there's good enough evidence to say that it's likely to be the case. It certainly was possible. We have evidence, literary evidence, of multiple sources that put him there. And there's a local oral tradition and archaeology and stuff like that that has these different churches and, and you know, the, the site of his burial and everything else. And like, why make that up? Who's getting something out of that by making that one up? In the second century, we have another man named Pantinus. He's the one that taught Clement of Alexandria. If you remember way back to our session on Clement of Alexandria, his teacher was named Pantinus. In 180 or 190, he is said to have gone to India as well. Not to live, but as a, on a trip, and he found Christians there. And that is mentioned by both Eusebius and Jerome. Another man named David of Basora in the year 300. We have a little statement about him from an Arabic history, which says, David, Bishop of Basora, having left his see, departed for India. He preached Christianity to the inhabitants of this country and converted many. And then there was another man named Theophilus, the Indian. He died in the year 364, so he's also in the 4th century. He was ordained a deacon by Eusebius of Nicomedia, and Theophilus, the Indian himself was from India, but he was living in the Roman Empire. And he was also, since he was ordained by Eusebius of Nicomedia, we know he was an Arian. He was a subordinationist. Because Eusebius of Nicomedia, during his lifetime, was the most significant subordinationist in the Roman Empire. He specifically took up Arius' cause and defended Arius and protected Arius. So this Theophilus went on a journey to India, and Philostorgius, the historian, writes about him. He says, Theophilus sailed off to the island of Deva. From there, he went to the rest of the Indian country, where he corrected much that was not being done by them in a lawful way. They would, for instance, listen to the gospel readings while seated, and they did other things not permitted. Let me just pause here. 
this is so uh, understandable. Like, let's imagine, just for a moment, that Christianity arrives in India in the first century. This guy's writing, he's, he's traveling in the year 364. So it's been 250 years or whatever, let's see, 214 years. A lot changes in 214 years. So as the church develops in other parts of the world, the church in India either stays the same or develops in different ways. And so Theophilus goes and he's like, these people are not standing when I read the Bible. What's wrong with them? And he says, you're doing it wrong. This is how we're doing it. And he gives them instruction on how the church does things in other places. It is not a sin to sit or to stand or to lie down when the scripture is read. You know what I mean? Like it's not commanded in scripture what posture to take, but it's a custom. And so there are differences in custom, which we would expect if it was a fairly isolated form of Christianity that was out of touch with uh, how things had been developing. Theophilus continues, when, however, he had, or this is Philostorgius talking about Theophilus, when, however, he had amended each of these matters with a view to their reverence and love of God, he confirmed the church's teaching. For they had no need of instruction to correct their worship, since they had held to the doctrine of other in substance unfailingly from the beginning. Let me pause there. We're in the middle of the 4th century. What's everyone talking about? Homoousios or heterousios? You know, of the same substance, of a different substance, or homoion, of like substance, right? So are we the same? Are we of like substance? Or are we of an other substance? And so Theophilus goes out there, and he says to these Indian Christians, father and son, you think they're of the same substance, or you think they're of a different substance? They say, well, we think these of a different substance. He's like, all right. We don't need to correct your, your doctrine. Your doctrine's good. I'm going home. <laughs> you know, so, so he goes up. He corrects their standing, not standing to read the Bible, but he thinks their doctrine is good. So says Philostorgius. From there, Theophilus, in Great Arabia, he set sail for the land of those Ethiopians who are called Aksumites, who live along the nearest shores of the Red Sea. He took care of the matters there and then returned to the Roman Empire. So this guy is making this route which makes perfect sense if you look at a map where he goes uh, from Alexandria, you take some camels a couple weeks across to the sea, you get in the, a boat on the Red Sea, you go down, Axum is one of those stops, a port city right outside of Axum, and then you're going to go across to the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, and then you're going to go over to India. I mean, it's just like boom, 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 exactly what you would do if you see a map and if you have reliable trade winds as they have figured out. In 356, Constantius requested King Azena to replace Frumentius. I talked to you about that because King Azena had Frumentius, and Frumentius was a, was a Homoousian guy. So uh, the emperor wants to replace him with Theophilus, this Indian guy, and have him be in, ch in charge of Ethiopia, or at their time it was called Axum. Uh, but I don't think Azena agreed with that. And we have to move on to one other thing. But before we do, I want to mention one last guy about India, a guy named Cosmas. Cosmas, the Indian voyager. He wrote a book called The Christian Topography in the Early 6th Century. And he reports of going to the island, which he calls Taprobane Island, which we call Sri Lanka. So that's the island at the very south of India. He reports that there are already Christians there in the 500s and that they're a minority. So that's another couple of data points that India has Christianity from the beginning. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Ethiopia has Christianity from the beginning. Armenia is the first Christian nation. Like, this whole time we've been talking about the Roman Empire this, the Roman Empire that, the Byzantines this, the barbarians that. Meanwhile, there's a whole other world out in the east and the south. All right, let's talk about Persia briefly. The Persian Empire was early on called the Parthian Empire and then the Sassanid or Sasanian Empire. And this is the empire that fought with the Roman Empire on its eastern border. And Christians were living there. The Christians in the Persian Empire are called Nestorian Christians. I have not told you about Nestorius yet. I'm going to tell you about him next time. Okay? He's a super significant person in the 5th century. Bishop of Constantinople, the capital of the whole empire. 428 to 431. 
So Nestorian Christians organized themselves in Persia during the Sassanian Empire. But before Nestorius, there already were Christians in Persia. And there were already Christians in Syria. And there were already Christians in this whole area. Even east of this, in India. There were already Christians there before the 5th century. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, they mention Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia. This is those people. That's a list of people from the east. Who are the people there on the day of Pentecost? They are Jewish pilgrims who traveled all the way to Jerusalem. After Pentecost is over, after the festival is over, they go all the way back to wherever they normally live. And they're bringing with them this message that this Messiah has come and his name is Jesus and he's been raised from the dead. I mean, this is, this is ground zero for Christianity to spread into Persia. Now, early on, the Persians were an extension of the Syrian church in Edessa. Edessa was this really significant part of the eastern part of the Roman Empire. It was a big city. And from there, Christians went out east into the Persian Empire. And at some points, Edessa could even be part of the Persian Empire as the Persians would advance on the Romans, and then the Romans would push them back, and then the Persians would win again. And this is the border between the two empires. In the 340s, King Shapur II persecuted Christians in Persia. And it was a response to Constantine favoring Christians in the Roman Empire. King Shapur decided that Christians must be spies for the Roman Empire because Constantine's favoring them. So he, Constantine's ending of the persecution in the West initiates a persecution against Christians in the East. Law of unintended consequences, right? Right? So this is a record of that from a historian named Sozomen, ancient historian. He says, When in the course of time the Christians increased in number and began to form churches and appointed priests and deacons, the Magi, who as a priestly tribe had from the beginning in successive generations acted as the guardians of the Persian religion, which is Zoroastrianism, became deeply incensed against them, against the Christians. The Jews who through envy are in some way naturally opposed to the Christian religion, were likewise offended. They therefore offended that Christians were growing in Persia. They therefore brought accusations before Sapur, the reigning sovereign, against Simeon, who was then Archbishop of Seleucia and Tesiphon, royal cities of Persia, and charged him with being a friend of Caesar of the Romans and with communicating the affairs of the Persians to him. Sapur believed these accusations, and at first ground the Christians with excessive taxes. It's called a double tax. Although he knew that the generality of them had voluntarily embraced poverty, he entrusted the exaction to cruel men, hoping that by the want of necessaries, this is an 1800s translation, so it's a little challenge, challenging, by the want of necessaries and the atrocity of ex-actors, they might be compelled to abjure their religion, for this was his aim. Afterwards, however, he commanded that the priests and conductors of the worship of God should be slain with the sword, the churches were demolished, their vessels were deposited in the treasury, and Simeon was arrested as a traitor to the kingdom and the religion of the Persians. Okay, so Sozomen, the historian, goes on to say that Shapur killed 16,000 Christians in this persecution. And he did it in nasty ways. Not just like beheadings or something, but persecution, torture, martyrdom. The whole same kind of thing that we saw with Diocletian a generation before in the West. However, in the year 410, there was a council at Seleucia Tesiphon, also called the Council of Mar Isaac. And the king there, King Yazdegerd I, who reigned from 399 to 421 in the year 410, he officially tolerated Christianity and he helped to organize the church and to have a structure to it. Now, Zoroastrianism was still the official religion of the Persian government, but now Christianity would be tolerated in Persia during the Sassanid Empire. In 424, the Church of the East declared its independence from the Church of the Roman Empire. 
and existed on its own and was bigger and more significant than the Western church. However, in the East, do you know what happened in this whole region? The Muslims. So in the 7th century, in the 8th century, and in the 9th century, you have the rise of Islam and the Arab tribes that start to conquer specifically Persia, which is modern-day Iran, is Persia, just to kind of place things for you. All right, let me just cover China in a couple of minutes, like two minutes, and then we'll conclude. Our main evidence for Chinese Christianity comes from a, um, a monument that was erected in the year 781. The monument is in uh, Xi'an, and it tells of an Nestorian missionary who came in the year 635, named Alvin. Okay? 635 is beyond our first 500 years of Christianity, so I'm not going to be talking about it. But that is something that happened in the 7th century. It's super significant for Chinese Christian history, and you should go study it if you want to know more about it. But I will say this, that there were contacts between the nomads in the north of China, because you can see on this map there's lots of these, these dots are all Christian churches. And you can see it's just north of China. And so uh, Samuel Moffat says, outside the Great Wall, Asia belonged to the nomads, not to the Chinese. And it was through these tribes of wild horsemen that beginning about the end of the 6th century, Christianity came irregularly and with varying effect into contact with the Chinese. So there was contact between Christians in the northern area, right just north of China where the Great Wall of China is, and the Chinese, but no great move of Christianity in China, no churches that we know of, until the 7th century when Alipin gets there. All right, let's review what we've learned. First up, Christianity spread to Africa from the 1st century in Egypt, the Maghreb, and Ethiopia. King Azena of the Aksumite Empire became a Christian due to the evangelism of Frumentius in the 330s. Athanasius of Alexandria ordained Frumentius bishop and ensured that homoousian Christianity would take root there. And indeed, to this day, the Ethiopians do strongly believe in the Trinity. Christianity spread throughout the Aksumite Empire in the 5th century through the work of the nine saints who built monasteries, including the one at Debre Damo. In the 6th century, King Caleb defeated the king of Himyar, which is modern-day Yemen, at the behest of the Roman emperor to protect Christians and rebuild their churches. Armenia became Christian through missionaries from Syria in the south and from Constantinople in the west. Grigor Lusavorich, Gregory the Illuminator, converted King Tiridates III, who then sponsored the conversion of Armenia in 301. In the 5th century, Mashtots worked with a team to invent the Armenian alphabet and translate the Bible and many other Christian documents into Armenian. And uh, incidentally, uh, as I'll mention later or in our next session, Armenia separated from the Roman church, the Byzantine and Roman church, in the year 451 as well, and has been its own church to this day, called the Armenian Apostolic Church. Although certainty is not possible, it is probable that the Apostle Thomas brought Christianity to India in the first century and Pantinus visited in the second century. Bishop Theophilus, the Indian, visited India in the 350s and reported the Christians there were subordinationists who believed the sun was other in substance. Persia had Christians from the first century, first from Jewish pilgrims who attended Pentecost, then through Syrian evangelistic efforts centered in Edessa. Christians living under the Sassanian rule of King Shapur II faced brutal persecution, torture, and martyrdom in the 340s. The council at Seleucia Tessaphon of 410 ended the persecution and gave structure to Christianity within the empire, though Zoroastrianism remained the official state religion in Persia. In 424, Persian Christianity declared itself independent of Roman Christianity. In the 6th century, nomads beyond the Great Wall of China likely brought Christianity in contact with the Chinese, although we can't say really for sure, but it's likely. Next time, we'll return to the subject of Christology.
We've looked at the Trinitarian controversy of the 4th century, but as it turns out, there was a huge controversy in the 5th century. One might even say a bigger controversy with bigger results in the 5th century than the, what I call, essentially a theological civil war of the 4th century. The 5th century was even bigger. And that controversy then repeated itself in the 6th century, too. And we'll look at that next time as we continue through our journey of early church history. Well, that brings this episode to a close. What'd you think? Come on over to restitudio.org and find episode 502, Early African, Armenian, and Asian Christianity, and leave your feedback there. Well, we got another review on Apple Podcasts. This is from Happy Chick 16 under the title Mind Blowing and Brilliant. And she writes, The truth has nothing to fear. I love this. Growing up as a nominal Trinitarian, I fumbled around being confused about what to believe, knowing what I've been taught as, quote, the truth, end quote, but it was vague and hard to define. I was curious to meet Daisy, a dynamic on-fire believer, and to gather that one could question this and not be a heretic or thrown into hell. It was a big barrier to get over to start even listening. Now I am listening and grappling with original texts. It's changing my life, my faith, and my understanding. It's such a relief to finally start to understand my faith. It's a crazy and in some ways a sad journey, especially to be beginning to see how Jesus and what he did for us has been demeaned and undermined by Trinitarian theology. I'm making tiny footsteps, learning, and these podcasts are a breath of fresh air. Well, thanks, Happy Chick 16 for writing in. That certainly is encouraging. I myself have not yet met Daisy officially, but uh, I'm also a fan of hers. Uh, she's doing great stuff along with her husband over there in the UK, and uh, real hopeful to see what results from their labors. We're working with other groups to get together and hopefully even put on an event uh, either this year or next year in the London area. Uh, that would be really awesome to see. Stay tuned for more information. I'm not really allowed to say anything yet about what's happening over there, but I'll just give you a little teaser here. This podcast is there to provide people with a challenge, a challenge to read the Bible in the context of the first century, to read the New Testament in particular within the Second Temple Jewish and Greco-Roman world in which it was written, to read the Old Testament within the ancient Near Eastern world in which it was written. And I think that when we do that, rather than reading it as medieval people or as those who are kind of answering the issues that Luther faced in the 16th century, or as Enlightenment-minded people, or as postmodern people, or whatever, I think reading it within the contextual thought world of the people who wrote it is really the way to go. And when you do that, you find that a lot of the later so-called obvious doctrines and dogmas of Christianity are just anachronistic. They're just not there. And so I think that opens up a little freedom to ask questions like, well, shoot, if the Trinity didn't develop until later, do we have to believe in it? If the idea of going to heaven when you die was a later idea, do we have to believe it? If eternal conscious torment is not something that was standard for Christian doctrine in the first few centuries. Do we have to believe it? And so on and so forth. Uh, we could go on and on about different doctrines that developed over time in ways that are not always compatible with what the Bible says. So as restorationists, what are we to do? What we do is we try to read the Bible from its own world and then allow that to challenge us rather than having us say, these are my doctrinal commitments, and now I'm going to go to the Bible and find support. We say, unleash the Bible like a dog on our beliefs and let it ravage our beliefs. If they are ravageable, if there is something that is loose or questionable or not solid, then let those beliefs go. Let the Bible loose and let it critique us rather than the other way around. And uh, that's really the enterprise of restorationism. And lots of Christians have been doing that for centuries. And yet, oftentimes, we've been shut down. We've been excluded. We've been 
we've not been published or we've not been allowed to attend the universities and, and so forth because of our failure to conform to the cardinal doctrines. Uh, but guess what? It's the 21st century times are a changing and there is a groundswell of not just people, but scholars, in fact, who are really seeing many of these truths in a much clearer light. And so, so it's an exciting time, isn't it? As we wind down, I've got a couple more episodes on this early church history class. As we wind down on that, I am hoping to get a number of scholars on, on, on different topics as I've had in the past. Uh, different books have come out recently that uh, I think would be of interest to you, listeners, to see where scholarship heading, what are some of those issues in recovering authentic Christianity, and then the second half of the Restitutio mission is how do you live it out today? Uh, so we want to restore authentic Christianity, but then we don't want to just put it on our shelf and say, oh, wow, look at that clear understanding that is biblical and historically accurate and, you know, that has shed all these layers of dust from the medieval period or the Enlightenment period and just never actually live it out. No, that's no good. We need to figure out how do we live out authentic Christianity today? How do we actually follow Jesus in the 21st century in in the modern technology-infused world with the societal issues that we are actually facing? And so that is something that I'm also very passionate about, not just dead faith, but living faith, and asking the question, well, how do we reach people? How do we make disciples of all nations, which is the commission that Jesus gave us? How do we parent? How do we do marriage? And all these kinds of things as well, which are practical issues that I think should naturally flow from our theological commitments and our understanding of the Bible. So stay tuned for some interviews on that as well in the near future. Thanks for writing in, and stay tuned for next time, where we look at the dual natures controversy of the 5th century, which is a period that may just blow your mind. Uh, So stay tuned for, (laughs) if you're interested in controversy, you're going to get it next week for sure. So stay tuned for that. If you'd like to support us, you can do that at restitutio.org. We'll catch you next week, and remember, the truth has nothing to fear.